Hello and welcome. Today we are going to talk a little bit about empirical dynamic modeling. We have looked at first principles models that apply principles of physics, conservation of mass, conservation of energy and so on and so forth to develop dynamic equations that describe the dyna dynamics of a process system. A much more practical approach is that of empirical modeling and we've talked about it earlier but it's good to repeat it. In the empirical modeling approach what we do is obtain the process reaction curve. What is the process reaction curve? The process reaction curve for example is you give a change in the step you give a change to the process input and see how the process responds. So this is u and this is y. This is called the process reaction curve. So we obtain the process reaction curve and then propose a combination of basic response types that can well fit the process reaction curve and uh, the basic response types that we have looked at are the first order lag, the second order over damped, under damped critically damped, uh, pure gain, pure dead time and things like that. So these basic response types, how do we combine them so that the response shape that we have in front of us in the process reaction curve, all the essential characteristics of that response shape are well captured. So we propose a combination of basic reaction types that well fit the process reaction curve and once we have proposed an appropriate combination of basic response types, the next step is to adjust these response type parameters because each a basic response type for example is a gain. What should be the magnitude of that gain? <coughs> a basic response type could be for example a lag. What should be the time constant of that lag? A basic response type that we are putting in is for example a pure delay. What should be the dead time or the delay time? So these basic response types, dynamic response elements have parameters and we need to adjust these parameters to well fit the process reaction curve, to fit the process reaction curve as well as possible. And then using this fitted model, we design a controller on the model because a model can be used to sh for simulations real processes you are not allowed to play with them but you can play as much as you want with the model so once we have a fitted well fitted model to the process reaction curve that well fitted model can be coupled with the controller and the control system performance tested and once we are happy with the control system performance those tuning parameters can be implemented on the real process and if the modeling is reasonably good if my model well fits the process reaction curve then hopefully that tuning will give us a decent closed loop response decent control performance so that is the idea behind empirical modeling uh, the key thing is the basic dynamic elements that we try and combine and we've seen this before but this time I'm associating equations with the basic dynamic elements. So you've got the pure gain which is essentially output is equal to k times an input. Then we have the pure delay. Output is k times the input but the input is delayed by theta time units. We've got the integrator where the up output is the integral of the input. Then we've got the lag and the lag is described by a first order differential equation pure lag and this first order differential equation has a time constant tau and its response to a unit step is given by this you know 1 minus e to the power minus t by tau times the magnitude of the step where this guy is delta u. We 
we also have second order so second order overdamped is from a second order differential equation this is the second order differential equation and its solution where tau 1 is not equal to tau 2 and for the without loss of generality let us say tau 1 is greater than tau 2 its solution is given by a combination of exponentials and it's plotted here if you had looked at a first order response first order response would have been much faster something of this kind yeah where the time constant is square root of tau 1 type tau 2 <coughs> yeah you could have a second order critically damped response and uh, that is also a second order system but then if you look at the characteristic equation of that second order system it's tau square lambda square plus 2 tau lambda plus 1 is equal to 0 and this solves to lambda is equal to minus 1 by tau minus 1 by tau so the root minus 1 by tau is uh, repeated twice and because it is repeated twice the solution has this form we've derived this in previous lectures and the response is faster no oscillations then we have second order under damped case and in the second order under damped case this damping coefficient is between 0 and 1 and uh, the response is an exponential decaying element and a sinusoidal element and the sinusoidal element comes because of the imaginary part to the roots of the characteristic equation and the response is fast but then it is it has some oscillations now if your damping coefficient goes less than zero then these oscillations become unstable and you get so this is an unstable system and the oscillations tend to blow up you could also get an unstable non oscillatory blow up and the governing the simplest dynamic element that can give you this is this guy where the only difference is from a lag is the fact that this sign is negative and if you look at the equation uh, the time solution of this equation the time solution is this guy and you can see because tau is positive because tau is greater than 0 e to the power t by tau blows up and therefore you get this exponential blow up kind of response now these basic dynamic elements can be combined and here are a few very simple examples of combinations of these basic dynamic elements if you have n lags combined in series with again then you get this classic s shaped response where this is the gain assuming that the unit it's a unit step response and uh, this S shape is a is a telltale sign of multiple lags in series. Um, you know, tanks in series, trays in a distillation column, uh, a plug flow reactor with you know modeled as a bunch of CSTRs in series and so on and so forth these are all small 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 lags that are feeding into each other <coughs> and therefore the response will have this typical lag shape you also have could get a lead lag a lead lag is nothing but a combination in parallel of a lag and a gain and the lag part of the circuit has a gain that is 1 minus k the other gain is k and so the net gain is 1 and if k is greater than 1 you get this blue curve if k is less than 1 you get this red curve this is a lead lag uh, you could also get a lag from a feedback structure so uh, imagine if this is a step then this would be a step initially this would be a step and because this is initially a step the integrator will start integrating but then you would start subtracting this signal out and as you start subtracting this signal out this guy will keep going down yeah because and this guy will keep going up but at a slower and slower rate and therefore you get what is a lag 
a lag kind of response so you can see that uh, a lag is actually a very neat combination of gain and integrator in a feedback loop the point is that these combinations can occur in a series this is a series structure this is a parallel structure this is a feedback structure and the parallel structure is very useful the feedback structure is very the feedback structure is what we use uh, in controls because control is by feedback so all these structures are you know this series lag and parallel structures are of fundamental importance here is a very neat uh, example of combining lags in parallel so because the speed of lag 2 is much much faster it rises quickly actually there's, there's a minus sign so it actually drops quickly sorry oh well sorry we go back and we have so this actually drops quickly this other guy is a slow lag but it has a gain that is large so therefore it rises slowly but by a large amount and when you add these two signals what then you get is a drop followed by a something like that uh, if if there if if in one of the parallel lines you don't have a lag instead you got a an integrator then what you get is this because the integrator keeps going up this guy keeps going up whereas uh, this guy goes down when you add these two what net you get is something like this yeah so these complex responses you can get uh, very nice complex shapes by combining basic response types uh, here's a pandemic response again by a parallel structure except that the two gains are the same so at final steady state you'll be back at zero so number of cases will be zero uh, at the time the virus got uh, exposed or unleashed into the general public number of cases were zero then they suddenly shot up and then slowly over time they went down uh, rippling ramp rippling ramp can be looked at as a ramp plus a sinusoid when you add these two what you get is a rippling ramp and a pure sinusoid can be obtained uh, for a second order system with a damping coefficient equal to zero that will give you a pure sign okay so that is how you'll get this this looks like life it keeps going up all down but then there are the usual ups and downs daily ups and downs of life you know now one of the most common li encountered responses is this s shaped slow response you give a step at time t equal to 0 and you get a very slow s shaped response which is shown here and one of the simplest ways of empirically modeling it is to uh, replace this s shaped response which is from multiple lags in series or maybe from multiple interacting lags is to replace this by uh, replace it by what pointer options ink colors maybe we'll do blue here we'll replace it by a dead time when nothing happens and an exponential so this is a pure dead time or a pure delay and this is a lag and of course you got a gain so 
this system is modeled by so you can see this over here you know the the yellow the the, the gray curve is the actual noisy response you filter it and fit a smooth curve which is in the in black uh, through the noisy response and to that black curve you fit a model and that model is the blue dotted curve which is not an exact fit to the model but is is a pretty good fit yeah so this empirical model that fits this s shape reasonably well is a lag again and a delay so we'll have the lag parameter tau lag time constant tau the gain k and the delay time theta these three parameters will have to be fitted or will have to be adjusted so that the fit with the process reaction curve the fit with the gray line is uh, reasonably good so this fitting is called identification you identify the model parameters once the model parameters are identified you design the controller on the model on the fitted model and then you implement those tuning parameters in the real process and validate the servo and regulator performance on the real uh, in on the real process and if the performance is not appropriate adjust the tuning a little bit if necessary but if your fitting is good such adjustment will not be necessary so now there are two commonly noted approaches in the literature that you'll find in textbooks and i'll go over them both but one is much better than the other method 1 it's actually very simple you basically choose two points on the process reaction curve there are two unknown parameters tau and that the time constant and the dead time theta gain of course is pretty simple so if you give a small change delta u and in response to that your output changes by delta y then the gain k is delta y by delta u so we know the gain now all that we need to find out is the time constant and the dead time now to find out the time constant and the dead time there are two unknowns so if you have two unknowns you need two equations and the two equations are very you know very practically found out by forcing the model response to exactly match the process reaction curve or the smoothened process reaction curve at two points and uh, two points what are those two points you know if you have a response that looks like this and there's sufficient noise if i choose my time point to match over here that is too close to the final steady state so i would say somewhere two two thirds and one thirds so if i'm going from if if the total response is k how long does it take for the response to complete two thirds of the way how long does it take for the response to go about one third of the way and it turns out that for a pure lag if you do 1 minus e to the power minus t by tau and if this t by tau is 1 then 1 minus e to the power minus t by tau is going to be 0.632 that means 63.2% of the response 63.2% of the response completes in one time constant if t by tau is 1 by 3 then you'll find out that 1 minus e to the power minus 1 by 3 is going to be 0.283 that's 28.3% of the response will complete in one third time constant so this is about one third the way and this is about two thirds the way so and these numbers are pretty clean so what we do is okay so let us note down the time at which 28.3% of the response complete that's this time 
the response has completed 28.3 percent of the way and let us uh, note the time at which the response completes 63.2 percent of the way 63.2 percent of the complete way is this guy at this point the time is this guy so i know t 63.2 and t 28.3 once I know T63.2 and T28.3, uh, then it's pretty straightforward. <coughs> what you then do is T28.3 must be equal to one third of the time constant plus the dead time, the dead time being over the period over which nothing happens. And then T63.2 percent must be equal to tau plus theta two equations this is known this is known two equations two variables just solve subtract the two equations and then what you get is tau is equal to 3 by 2 times t 63.2 percent minus t 28.3 percent and if you do the elimination the other way so multiply this equation by 3 and subtract it from the other equation so then what you will get is theta is equal to half times 3 times t 28.3 percent minus t 63.3 percent and that's what is written over here and of course k is obtained like this so <coughs> on this figure what I have done is uh, as before the gray curve the gray noisy curve this is the process reaction curve this is the process reaction curve the blue line is the smoothened you know you 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 take the noise out and pass a smoothened curve through the so that's the smoothened reaction curve and to that smoothened reaction curve from that smoothened reaction curve you obtain t28.3 and t63.2 and then from these two equations you get your tau and theta k is known and then if you simulate a first order plus dead time process with a time constant this way and a dead time this way and a k on and again this way uh, the magenta curve is the response that we get and you can see that the magenta curve does not exactly fit the model uh, the process reaction curve but it's a pretty decent fit to the process reaction curve it fits the process reaction curve pretty well and you can see that it passes through these two points exactly because that is how we designed it <coughs> all right this is method one method two which is given in textbooks is is over here and what is done here is again you have the gray curve and the smoothened blue curve and if you look at the blue curve uh, you find the that point where the rate of change of y where the rate of change of the process variable is the highest and that point is this guy and this is an inflection because here you have maximum rate of change if you go beyond in time over here the rate of change of y actually decreases if you go over here again the rate of change so you know the rate of change so basically if you this is an inflection it is an inflection so you find the inflection point inflection means that the rate of change of the variable is maximum at that point and therefore the second derivative is zero so this is an inflection point what you do is at this mark the inflection point on the process reaction curve or on the smoothened process reaction curve and then draw a tangent a line that is tangent to the process reaction curve at the inflection point so this will have a slope and this slope is the maximum why is it the maximum because the slope at inflection by definition is maximum so this is maximum slope possible and when you draw this line it will cut the okay so this is 2.5 the gain there was k but it should have been k here it will cut the k line at a certain point 
and it will cut the zero line at a certain point wherever it cuts wherever it cuts the time axis you say that that is the dead dead time and wherever it cuts the the k line you say that that is tau plus theta so this is theta and this is tau yeah this is theta and this is tau this is the way for ident identifying it and you can see that this identification is fine but the plant model mismatch you know the i did the identification this way and the fitted model curve is the blue or is the magenta dashed curve that's the fitted model curve uh, the fit is not really all that great of course this goes like this and this will keep going like this so eventually it will all become you know so the fit is not really all that great uh, but nevertheless this is something that was used in the olden times and you'll find this in lots of textbooks okay so then what do you do so you got a model so what you do then is you take your model and now you design your controller using this model and maybe it has a set point there so you design this you can design it using control theory or you can design it using simulations right now just do it using simulations because we haven't covered enough theory yet but nevertheless if you design it and then you get a very nice i don't know let's say you design it for a very nice servo response so you on the model eh? so this is the model predicted servo response and you are happy with the kc tau i and the tau d that you have used you could for example use fmin con or an optimizer to obtain the best kc tau i and tau d for the servo response on the model so y m yeah and then these kc tau i tau d that you obtained you apply it to the real process and then see how the real process performs and that's what i've done using these two identification techniques so let's look at this guy first so when you use method 1 when you obtain a pid controller tuning on a model that is fitted using method 1 you can see the the response is actually quite good that's the model response but then when you apply the same tuning on the process the process response is different and it's different because the model is not an exact fit but you can see that this is acceptable so you see working with the odd model which is a reasonable representation of the plant you get a tuning that is actually acceptable in practice on the other hand if you use method 2 the model response as usual is pretty good you can see it here it's pretty damn good however when you apply this tuning on the actual process because the plant model mismatch in in method 2 is much larger you can see that the plant response is actually much more oscillatory so this may or may not be acceptable it's too oscillatory and so if it is too oscillatory what you would do is uh, increase the tau i a little bit and uh, decrease the kc a little bit and then the oscillations will you know sort of the response will become slower and the oscillation will not be as much something like that is what you'll get then so with method 2 you will have to intervene with method 1 the tuning that you get in the first go uh, is reasonably good so plant model mismatch if the plant model mismatch is large then the tunings that you get using for example an optimizer uh, may not be acceptable in the plant and you may need to tweak the tuning further but if the plant model mismatch is acceptably small is small enough then the tuning that you get 
from the model may be directly applicable to the plant. So the point is that the tunings that you get from these models are indicative in nature. You need to test them out in the real plant and if the real plant performance with that tuning is not acceptable, tweak those tunings. But what are the first tunings that you should be applying? You can get that from the model. So in summary what we have seen is that the empirical approach is simple and practical. It applies locally to any system and the system may be electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering. So if you have to make say for example first principles models, you need to know heat and energy balances, mass and energy balances, you need to know thermodynamics, vapor liquid equilibrium and things like that to develop those first principles models. Similarly electrical and mechanical you will have to know those you know Kirchhoff's law and this and that and force balance and torque balance and things like that to develop mechanical models of systems. So the first principles approach is discipline specific or, or whereas the empirical approach any system you can give a change in the input look at how the output responds and then fit something that fits the output response reasonably well. So the empiric empirical approach is very simple very practical and, the, and it is applicable to all kinds of system to any system the key word there is any. The key step is in proposing an appropriate combination of basic response types that well fit the process reaction curve which when combined will 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 exhibit all the specific characteristics in the dynamic response all the main features in the dynamic response we've also looked at first order plus dead time model fitting and proposed method one. Method one is based on obtaining how long it takes for the response to complete 63.2 percent and how long it takes for the response to complete 28.3 percent and from these two times you obtain the, uh, the time constant and the dead time. Of course gain is obtained by delta y by delta u so I have not noted that and what we found was that method one actually gives a model that well fits the process reaction curve. Method two is obtained Method 2 obtains the dead time and the uh, time constant from the tangent at the inflection point in the process reaction curve. Uh, however, we saw that the fit was not so good and because the fit was not so good, the closed loop performance of method 2 is inferior due to plant model mismatch, significant plant model mismatch. So that's that. With this, I will close my lecture and hope to see you next time. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye.